Hello, everyone. We are now in the fourth reading of It Ain't So Awful Falafel, and we're beginning on page 85. I have English, social studies, and pre-algebra with Carolyn, so I go to her house after school a couple times a week to do homework with her. We're taking a break, sitting in their family room in front of their huge 20-inch color Zenith TV, while Mrs. Williams irons a pile of shirts. My family has a black and white zenith at home, but it's a 13 inch tabletop with an antenna, which constantly have to get up and adjust. Sometimes we dip a wire hanger to the antenna and somehow that makes the picture clearer. Color TV is so much better. My dad wants to buy one, but he says there's no point since we can't take it back to Iran with us. The electricity current is different there. Whenever we go to Sears, we have to go to the TV section so my dad can see what the newest Zenith models that we can't have look like. He always likes to stand there and say the slogan from the commercials. Zenith, the quality goes in before the name goes on. A report about the protests in Iran starts, complete with full color footage of crowds in Tehran. During the commercial, Carolyn turns to me and asks, what's the Shah like? I think for a minute about how to describe the Shah to an American. You don't have anyone like him in America. He's like someone in a fairy tale. He and his family live in a palace and have the fanciest and most expensive of everything, including jewelry straight out of Aladdin's tale. Whoa, Carolyn, Carolyn exclaims, a little surprised. You never see the president and Mrs. Carter wearing crowns, but the Shah and his wife wear them. And they also have thrones, capes, imperial swords, and belts, all covered with emeralds, diamonds, and rubies. They don't do stuff with ordinary people, ever. I guess when you own a belt with a huge emerald instead of a buckle, you don't mingle with the baker or the plumber. I bet he's never talked to a taxi driver. Is that the main problem? Yes, but it's more than that. If you're friends with the Shah, you have all the advantages in the world, education, a high paying job and a nice house. Even if you commit a crime, you don't get punished. Rules do not apply to the rich and well connected. You are guaranteed a life of privilege. You don't have to try. A perfect comparison pops into my head. It's like those cars at Disneyland that are on track so you don't need to steer. Rich people are on a good track from birth. They can just sit back and enjoy the ride. Poor people are on a bad track and they can't change anything no matter how much they try to steer in a different direction. Their life is set, just like those tracks. It's different here. Abraham Lincoln started out poor and then he became president, Carolyn points out. Things like that don't happen in Iran. Sounds like classic corruption, Mrs. Williams chimes in. The president of the United States is an ordinary human being who wins an election. He doesn't have a throne or a bejeweled sword but that would be great for photos, she laughed at the idea. And people don't curtsy to him, I say. I don't even think Americans know how to curtsy, Carolyn adds, except at the ballet. And the Shah never retires. He rules until he dies. Our president serves for eight years max, interjects Miss Williams. She walks over to the TV and turns it off. Get back to work, ladies. One more second, Mom. Carolyn turns to face me, cross-legged on the sofa. Her shot almost sounds like some kind of God, she concludes. I guess I've never really thought about it. He's always been there for as long as I've been alive. His picture is everywhere. If you go to a bank, there he is above the doorway. If you go to the hardware store, there's his picture above the cash register. If you open your textbook, there he is right before the first chapter. His face is like wallpaper. That would never happen here because the picture would have to change every after every election, Carolyn explains, offering me the bowl of pretzels that was on the coffee table. I know. I take a handful of the salty snacks. I've already been here for three presidents. When I first came to Compton in second grade, the president was Nixon. Then it switched to Ford. Then we went back to Iran, same old Shah. Then we came back to America for this assignment, and you have President Carter now. My dad says it's amazing how American presidents change without any, without any fighting or wars. For my whole life, it has always been the Shah. When the Shah dies, it will be his oldest son. We don't get to vote on that. So if the Shah is so powerful and he doesn't allow free speech, why hasn't he stopped the demonstrations, Carolyn asks in between bites of pretzels. Whenever there were demonstrations before, the secret police, Savak, 
S-A-V-A-K, would take the protesters to jail and torture them. This always scared others away from protesting. Apparently, it isn't working anymore. Protesters are actually getting killed, but people keep demonstrating. Wow, that's huge. She wipes crumbs off her shirt. The Shah likes to scare people. He buys the most modern weapons in the world for his military and shows them off during parades. My dad says you don't see tanks and guns on parade in America because democracy keeps the country together, not fear of the military. Carolyn looks at me thoughtfully. Now that I think about it, that's true. I've never seen a tank in a 4th of July parade, just marching bands, dogs wearing tutus and people dressed like Uncle Sam. Once I even saw a dog dressed like Uncle Sam. A dog dressed like Uncle Sam. I nod, relieved that she understands. You're lucky that people can do that kind of stuff in America and no one ends up in jail. We each grab another handful of pretzels and get up from the sofa. Our homework still awaits us in the dining room. On the way to our first Girl Scout meeting a few weeks later, I start telling Carolyn stories about babysitting David. He's such an interesting boy, I say. We have an expression in Persian. Gur a mavesa. Gur is an unripe grape, and maviz is a type of raisin. That's David. He's both young and old at the same time. I love that expression, Carolyn says. By the way, how much do you get paid? A dollar an hour. Is that it? She sounds shocked. What do you mean, I ask. Who came up with that amount? Mrs. Klein said, how about a dollar an hour? And I said, that would be great. First of all, you should never answer right away, Carolyn says, clearly annoyed. Secondly, you should have asked for a dollar and a quarter. If she asks you to do dishes or take care of any pets, that's an extra 25 cents for each chore. You need to ask for more next time. I make 150 an hour, sometimes $2 with add-ons. I don't know. She's really nice, and I don't think I can ask for more now. I've already babysat a bunch of times. That seems kind of rude, I say. Rude, repeats Carolyn. That's called business. Plus, there's college. You are saving for college, aren't you? No. Well, you'd better start. You have six years. Tick tock, tick tock. It's going to be there before you know it. I've never thought about paying for college, but Carolyn's right. There is no way I'm going to ask for money from Mrs. Klein, though. I'll just save everything I earn from now on. The Girl Scout troop in Newport Beach is huge, with about 80 girls. Thankfully, original Cindy is not one of them bad enough that I PE with her twice a week, where she now pretends I don't exist. It's better than that first day when she laughed at me, but I still can't believe I spent six weeks listening to her horse tales and shedding an entire layer of skin for nothing. When I told the story to Carolyn, she said, you shed that friendship like you shed your skin. I liked that. It made the whole story episode seem less pathetic and more poetic. During the break, I start talking to a girl named Rachel, whom I recognize from two of my classes. I heard, you knew, I heard you're new this year, so how do you like Newport Beach so far, she asked. I like it, I answer. It's getting more fun as I make friends. I moved here in third grade, and I remember how hard it is to be a new kid. We should do something sometime, she suggests. We should, I agree, and we exchange phone numbers. The Girl Scout leaders, Mrs. Starr and Mrs. Wood, seem really nice. They tell us all about the Girl Scout Jamboree, camping trips, and a place called the Goodwill, where we will be volunteering. I have never been camping, so I'm more excited about that than anything else. Carolyn knows a lot of the girls in the meeting since she was born and raised in Newport Beach. I can't help but think how much easier it is to live in one place your whole life. I will never know that feeling. Before she drives me home, Mrs. Williams asks if I would like to have dinner with them. It's make your own taco night, she says. Yes! I answer. My parents and I love the tacos at Taco Bell. I just have to call my mom from your house. When we arrive, Mrs. Williams sets up the dinner table, which, while well, I call my mom, I'm 100% sure she's going to say yes because I am 100% sure that dinner at our house is something cold and out of a box. Somehow, my mom has decided that breakfast food works just as well for dinner, so now our pantry looks like the cereal aisle at El Rancho Market. I definitely prefer tacos. She says yes and reminds me to thank the Williamses, as if I would forget. Make Your Own Taco Night is basically Mexican heaven and a million times better than Taco Bell. Carolyn, Matt, and their parents and I sit around the dining room table, which is covered with all kinds of ingredients. Matt starts telling us about his latest debate tournament as we pass the plates around. 
Mr. Williams is asking Matt all kinds of questions. He was also on the debate team when he was in high school. I'm trying to listen to the questions, but I'm also trying not to miss any of the ingredients. This meal definitely requires concentration because you have to add the fillings in the right order. I get, I put meat, lettuce, tomatoes, cheese, onion, salsa, guacamole, extra cheese, and extra salsa in my taco shell. It is the messiest and tastiest meal I have had in a long time. But for some reason, tacos don't fill me up. Mine were more stuffed than anyone else's, but I'm still hungry. In Iran, eating a lot of food at someone's house is the polite thing to do. The, oh, excuse me. The hostess keeps insisting you eat more, even after the top button of your pants is popped and you're lying on the floor, regretting the fourth helping. My dad had told me that in America, hosts don't push food on you. Still, I'm hoping Mrs. Williams will say, have another. You barely ate anything. She doesn't. After my third taco, I asked Mrs. Williams how she made this dinner. Oh, goodness, I can't even call this cooking. It's really just assembling, except for the ground beef, which you just cook in a pan, she says. You can buy all the ingredients at El Rancho Market, right near your house. My mom loves these make-it-yourself meals, Matt explains. If you stick around long enough, you'll see that she has a whole menu of meals where we actually have to do all the work, but she gets all the credit. Excuse me, Matthew, Mr. Williams interjects. Would you like to cook dinner from now on? Then you'll be allowed to complain about your mother's dinners. Matt doesn't say anything. So how do you bend the taco shells without breaking them, I ask. They all laugh. It's the first time I have made them laugh, and it feels nice, not at all embarrassing. But I don't know what's so funny. The shells come in a box already bent, Carol says. Isn't it obvious? No, I say. It's like grasshopper pie. Like what, she asks. One time I asked my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Goodspeed, if there are any grasshoppers in grasshopper pie. She laughed too. But there are apples and apple pie and pecans and pecan pie, so why not grasshoppers and grasshopper pie? Good point, said Mrs. Williams. After we finish eating, she stands up and starts to clear the table. It just so happens that we have make yourself Sundays for dessert, she announces. No complaints here, exclaims Matt. Didn't think so, quips Mrs. Williams with a chuckle. She sets up a round tray on the table. Now, Cindy, here's something you might not have seen yet. This tray, which turns like this, is called a Lazy Susan. She starts setting up little bowls of chopped nuts, candy toppings, and chocolate sauce. Lazy Susan, I repeat. I wonder who Susan was, says Matt. Probably the inventor's wife, says Mr. Williams. Who then became his ex-wife, adds Mrs. Williams. Everyone laughs again. So much happiness in this house. I wish my mom laughed. I have a sudden thought. Mrs. Williams, there are no Iranians here, and my mother doesn't have any friends. Do you think you can do something with her? You need to know that she does not speak English, play tennis or golf, and she does not hike. Of course, Mrs. Williams says, handing each of us a napkin. I'll invite her to the next PTA meeting. She'll meet lots of nice people volunteering, and she'll pick up some English, too. I'm so glad I asked her. As soon as the Williams suits drop me off, I tell my mom the good news. But I can tell. Oops. Well, I guess that's it. I can't read, you guys. I have to stop for a second because the lights just went out in here. Okay, they're back on. Um, my mom says she doesn't want to do anything with anyone until she learns English. Plus, she's still mad at me about the pool key. But you can learn English by talking with Americans. It's better practice than just watching people with coffee makers and dining room sets on let's make a deal, I say. I need to learn English first, she repeats. This, that makes no sense. It makes sense to me, she insists. The adults that you meet are real, would be really nice. They don't care if your English isn't perfect, I assure her. I'm not interested, my mother says, and leaves the room. You have to learn English, Mama, I yelled after her. I don't want to be your translator anymore. I hear her bedroom door slam. I don't know what to do. My mother is so difficult, and whenever I try to help her, she doesn't listen. I know her life would be so much better if she made a little effort. And now I have to tell Mrs. Williams, who has been so nice to me, to forget our conversation. 
I called Carolyn. Can you please tell your mom that my mom is too busy to go to PTA meetings, but thank you very much for the offer. How does your mother know that she'll be too busy for PTA meetings when she doesn't even know the dates yet? Carolyn asked. Well, I say, trying to think of how to explain this. In Iran, we studied plants. We learned that some plants grow in certain places, but not in others. That's why Iran has the world's best pistachios, but no pineapples. You could say my mom is like a pistachio. Pistachios also grow in California, Carolyn points out. Not my mom. Right then and there, I give up trying to find a friend for my mother. The day before we left Compton, when my dad and I were taping shut the packed boxes, I said, Baba, do you think Mama will be happier in Newport Beach? He doesn't answer right away. Ever since we moved to America, my mom spends a lot of time being sad. She didn't want to move here the first time we came, even though it was only for two years. For months before we left, her three sisters would come over every day, and they would just sit together, drink tea, and cry, and cry, and cry. I didn't understand why, since we were going to come back. The whole two years in Compton, my mom was sad. She didn't even try to like it. My dad planned fun weekends for us, like going to the Gilroy Garlic Festival, the Cloverdale Citrus Fair and the Palm Springs Date Festival, but nothing really worked. My mom didn't even try the garlic ice cream or the date shakes. I loved seeing all those places, but it didn't make a difference for her. My dad told her she could get whatever clothes she wanted from the Sears catalog. Not even that worked. Then we went back to Iran, and she was a little happier, but after a year, my dad got another assignment, so we moved back to Compton, and it was the same old thing. My mom watched TV all day and didn't have any friends. But, we, but when we were moving to Newport Beach, I still hoped maybe things would change. After a long pause, my dad finally said, you have to be patient and understand that it will take time for your mother to adjust to living here. It's much easier being American in Iran right now than being Iranian in America. What do you mean, I asked. In Iran, there are 50,000 Americans. What are they doing there? They work for oil and gas companies, the military, the universities, you name it. Plus, there's about 2,000 American students at the Tehran American School. I'm the only Iranian at my school. It's not lonely for Americans in Iran. They can see movies in English. Can you imagine if we could see movies in Persian in California? And there are lots of clubs, clubs for people who speak their language. It's so much easier. They have a community. In the total of three years we have lived in America, we ran into two other Iranians only once. We were at a mall, and suddenly we heard people speaking Persian. That had never happened before. Speaking Persian in America is like speaking a super secret language that no one understands. It's handy, except that my mom is always telling me in front of people to stand up straight, don't have a third cookie, and other generally annoying stuff. So we went up to the people at the mall and asked them in Persian if they were Iranian. They were so shocked. It was like two polar bears running into each other in Hawaii. You are like me. How did you end up here, so far away from home? I was so relieved because I thought this meant my mom would finally have a friend, but they said they were just visiting California on vacation. We invited them to our house the next weekend anyway. I hadn't seen my mom that happy in a long time. She made kebabs and rice. I told her we should serve Kentucky Fried Chicken with biscuits and coleslaw since that would be more special for them. My mom said that was the most ridiculous thing she'd ever heard. I know why she thought that. If you are Iranian and you, and you invite someone to your house, your food must be homemade. Persian, Persian, and perfect. Food is the most important part of every Iranian's life. Let's say you're invited to someone's house for dinner, and let's say this person shelters orphans and also discovered the cure for malaria, but the rice is not good. The next day, everyone will be talking. The rice was terrible. The rice was horrible. How can she live with herself? And Iranians never forget. You can't say my Aunt Gila's name without someone saying, you mean the one who burned her rice? That happened before I was born, and even I know about it. I was also told my mom, by my mom, that instead of fruit for dessert, we should serve chips ahoy. No, I said that wrong. I also told my mom that instead of fruit for dessert, we should serve chips ahoy chocolate chip cookies and Baskin Robbins ice cream, genuine American food. But my mom gave them watermelon. 
which is the most common dessert where I come from. I was certain they would have liked my idea better. Everyone in the world has tried watermelon, but Baskin Robbins rainbow sherbet, that's something they would have remembered forever. My mom never listens to me. Twice a week, I have drama class. We read plays, which are basically books written as if people are talking. It's my first time ever reading plays, and I love it. It feels like I'm an invisible visitor in someone's life. The first play we read is A Streetcar Named Desire by Tennessee Williams. Our teacher, Mrs. Crockett, gave us two weeks to read it and write an essay. But I started it on Friday, and now it's Sunday, and I'm almost done reading. It's a very sad story, but I can't put it down. Tennessee Williams makes you think you are right there in New Orleans. I can practically feel the humid weather. I get to the end of the book, and the main character, Blanche Dubois, is being taken away to a hospital. And it's a really, really sad scene. She looks at the doctor and says, I have always depended on the kindness of strangers. I go back and read it again and again. That is the best sentence ever. I could say the same thing about myself. When you move to another country, you always depend on strangers. You're so alone. I thought about all the kind people who had helped us in Compton and how without them my life would be so different. I bet when Tennessee Williams wrote that line for Blanche Dubois, he didn't think that a girl from Abadan, Iran, would tape it to her wall. But that's just what I do. Two weeks later, we have to listen to everyone's report on the play. The first person called is Mary Howard. I recognize her from the Girl Scout meeting. She's the tallest girl in the troop, so she's hard to miss. She walks slowly to the front of the room, and I can tell she's nervous. Before she begins, Mrs. Crockett says, All right, class, I want you on your best behavior. Mrs. Crockett is a sweet-looking older lady, the exact type of teacher that certain kids don't listen to. That's one thing I quickly figured out about middle school, that kids are so much ruder than in elementary school. Mary starts speaking with a shaky voice. I am doing my report on the main characters in a sweet, a streetcar named Desire. She pronounces it Desiree instead of Desire. A boy in the front row turns around and says, Desiree? She called it Desiree. What an idiot. He says it so loudly that the whole class hears. Then a couple other kids start laughing and saying, Desiree? Mary looks like she's about to cry. Maybe this is why my mom resists learning English. She's afraid people will make fun of her if she makes a mistake. It takes a while for Mrs. Crockett to calm everyone down. She's not very good at that. Mary starts again, but she keeps forgetting her speech and saying, um, 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 all the time. After class, I run up to her. Hey, I thought that it was pronounced Desiree too, I say. That is not true. I'm so embarrassed, she says, and my speech was horrible. Not at all, I insist. Those kids are just mean, and mean people are always louder than the rest of us. Hey, weren't you at the Girl Scout meeting? I was. Were you there too? Yes, I'm Cindy. I just moved here. Nice to meet you. She holds out her hand and I shake it. Everyone calls me Howie. There are a lot of Marys in our class. All right, Howie, I say smiling. And just like that, with a little help from Tennessee Williams, I make another friend. We're almost finished with dinner when, dad, when David's dad stops by. His name is also David, but my dad calls him Davood, which is the Persian version. They met a couple weeks ago when he came over and asked to borrow our ladder. My dad was so happy. He actually gave a short lecture on the oil industry during the time it took him to get the ladder out of our garage and into theirs. Dr. Klein didn't seem to mind. My father opens the door and invites him in. Thank you, but I just wanted to return the ladder. I was able to do a lot of projects around the house for Rhonda. Any time, Davoud. And would you like dinner or something to drink, my dad asks. I just ate, thank you, says Dr. Klein. Are you sure? No dinner, Dr. Davoud, my mother asks popping in from the kitchen. Yes, thank you, says Dr. Klein. Just a little, my mom presses on. I'm good, says Dr. Klein, smiling at my, um, my mom. I only have a few minutes before I got to get back home, but thank you, maybe next time. I appreciate that he is not annoyed, since some people would be. Next time, my mom repeats, stopping the, to stopping the tour, the custom of not non-stop offerings of food to guests. It's an Iranian 
way of being polite, but it doesn't translate in America. Here, it seems pushy. In this case, Dr. Klein was lucky. My mom gave up pretty quickly. I open the garage door for you, my dad says. I follow him. So, Mo, Dr. Klein says as he sets down the ladder by the washing machine, I'm curious about something. Jimmy Carter is always talking about human rights. What's your take on the subject? I can tell my dad is excited to give another mini lecture to Dr. Klein. He gets this look on his face when he can't, that he, when he can't wait to say something. I imagine it is very hard for Americans to understand the value of human rights and free speech. How can you appreciate something you have always had? He pauses for a moment. Perhaps it's like gravity. No one ever says, thank goodness for gravity. But if it, is suddenly, if it suddenly went away, we would all appreciate it. My dad is such an engineer. Who uses gravity as an example of anything? That's true, Dr. Klein says, looking thoughtful. American comedians are still making fun of when President Nixon said, I am not a crook, my dad shakes his head in disbelief. No one could ever do that in Iran. If they did, they would end up in prison. And when President Ford bumped his head getting out of the helicopter, they kept showing it on TV over and over again. People made fun of him and called him a bad name. Clut, said Dr. Klein with a chuckle. I could not believe this, my dad exclaimed, throwing both hands in the air. If the Shah ever bumped his head, no one would ever hear about it. Instead, there would be news reports about how he has never bumped his head. We would never call him that word. Dr. Klein laughed. Our presidents would probably appreciate not being the punchline of jokes. He starts to leave. Yes, my father says, and some of the jokes are very funny. I just wish your comedians talked more slowly. I agree, and I wish I could stay longer, but I have promised to help David with his science project. I'd love to continue the conversation later. Dr. Klein shakes my dad's hand before walking out of the garage. Thanks, Mo, for helping me understand this crazy world a little bit better. Any time, my dad says. I have much more to tell you. Dr. Klein smiles. Nice to see you too, Cindy. He put past me on the head. And Mo, if you ever want to play a round of golf, let me know. Yes, yes, my dad says quickly, even though he really means, no, thank you. I have no idea how to play golf. Okay. We are going to stop there. We are on page 109, and great seeing you all.